All right, I think it is about time to, for us to get started. Um, thank you for making the trek out to the event center. I know this is probably like the farthest building, of, or farthest, farthest room away from the banquet hall. Um, this is the SIG Auth deep dive. So uh, I'm Mike, this is Margo. Hello, um, I'm Margo. Um, I'm a software engineer uh, for uh, VMware Tanzu. Um, I work on Pinniped, which is part of uh, uh, Tanzu's authentication stack. And uh, I'm Mike, I'm a software engineer at Google. I've been working on GK and Kubernetes for uh, almost seven years, actually over seven years now. And I am a uh, co-chair and TL of SIG Auth. So um, this afternoon, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of an intro to SIG Auth, uh, walk through, um, kind of review uh, what we did over the last year, or year and a half, um, and then highlight a couple um, enhancements that are underway um, that I think are interesting. And then I'm going to hand it off to Margo. Uh, she's going to walk through an implementation of uh, a client Go uh, exec auth plugin uh, to get you, uh, give you kind of a feel of uh, how to extend uh, human control client authentication. Um, and yeah, and then we'll wrap it up and go to questions. So. Uh, so SIG auth, uh, what we do, this is our uh, patron XKCD comic. Um, the Kubernetes community is uh, uh, in, uh, uh, very uh, inventive. Um, they're doing a lot of cool things all the time. Uh, I, can, I consider like SIG auth's responsibility to make sure that you know, operators and security administrators are um, you know, able to you know, draw, I, I guess, guardrails around what engineers are doing. Um, you know, examples of um, maybe auth relevant features in Kubernetes are, um, you know, uh, new, new, new flags in the security context of a pod that, you, that an administrator want, might want to control. Um, uh, maybe cross namespace PVC references where persistent volume claim references, um, maybe taints uh, and tolerations that are used for node isolation. Um, so this is our mission statement. So SIGAuth is responsible for features in Kubernetes that control and protect access to the API and other core components. This includes authentication and authorization, but also encompasses features like audit logging and security policy. Um, so this is like on paper uh, what the SIGAuth mission statement is over the last um, you know, many years that SIGAuth has existed and been meeting. Uh, we've kind of adopted um, ownership of various things that don't really fit neatly into this definition. Um, and we can talk about those later. Uh, uh, if you aren't aware already, um, there's uh, a newly established um, as of uh, in the last year, uh, SIG called the SIG Security, um, who, you know, might take over various things that have fallen on the SIGAuth community in the past. Um, so uh, this is a full list of uh, sub-projects. Um, on the left side, these are uh, sub-projects that are in uh, the Kubernetes core code base, so github.com, Kubernetes, Kubernetes, um, audit logging subsystem, uh, all authenticators, um, uh, authorizers, including you know, RBAC, ABAC, uh, node authorizer, um, uh, certificates API and related infrastructure, so um, uh, any entry signers uh, or approvers for um, uh, the, the infrastructure that Kubelet uses to uh, uh, do certificate rotation for both its server and client certificates. Um, encryption at rest, so uh, that would be the KMS plugin for uh, encrypting um, data stored in NCD at rest. Um, node isolation and identity, so uh, the, the authorizer and admission controller responsible for um, uh, preventing cross-node uh, escalations. Um, policy management such as, you know, uh, RBAC and also uh, pod security admission um, and anything service, Kubernetes service count related. Um, so out of tree, we have kind of a uh, multi-tenancy working group um, and they have kind of an uh, incubator pr uh, project. Um, out of that incubator came the hierarchical namespace controller, which is a project um, that is focused on synchronizing uh, policy uh, across a hierarchy of namespaces. 
um, and the Secret Store CSI driver, which is uh, a um, CSI driver that integrates with various Secret Stores. I think Azure, GCP, AWS, and Vault right now all have uh, plugins, um, and they expose kind of a Secrets API, but rather than having the Secrets be stored in etcd, they are stored um, you know, in your Secret Manager of choice. And coming soon, so this is a recently, uh, or I guess, currently going through induction uh, sub-project. So the Cube RBAC proxy is a, a pretty uh, widely used popular project. Um, and we have recently decided to make it an official SIGOS sub-project. Um, I'm not sure if I said it, but at any point, just raise your hand if you have questions. Um, so uh, what have we done in the last year and a half? So pod security admission is GA in 125, which is the upcoming, upcoming release of Kubernetes. We also just recently merged a PR to uh, delete pod security policy uh, from the Kubernetes code base. So that's a huge accomplishment. Um, certificates API went to GA with a couple new uh, features, um, specifically like signer partitioning. Um, the exec auth plugin, which we uh, keep control uh, credential providers, are now GA. Um, that's what Margot will be speaking on later. Uh, token requests is GA, and secret source CSI driver is GA. So uh, looking forward, I have a couple kept to highlight. Um, the first one is um, you know, going through a review right now. It's uh, something called trust anchor sets. So right now, um, various things like uh, uh, Kubernetes itself, um, Istio, uh, um, the a certificate manager, um, need to have a need, common need to distribute certificate bundles to uh, all pods in a cluster. Right now, the state of the art to do that is a config map, since config maps can only be referenced um, by pods in the same namespace as the config map. Uh, you end up synchronizing uh, config maps uh, like that have the same data across you know, many namespaces has presented a scalability issues um, in clusters with many namespaces um, you know, uh, because that data is stored in SCD and has to be scanned and you know, read into QBAS server memory. So I would think of this uh, trust anchor set as a global object so that that data can be uh, you know, stored once and referenced across the entire cluster. Um, it's, I, if you've ever written like a dynamic webhook uh, configuration, you also have to embed uh, you know, a certificate for um, a Cube API server to uh, establish a connection to uh, the webhook. So uh, these should, will also be referenceable and you won't have to do that. Um, I know that you know, in the uh, current mechanism is kind of gross um, and not super portable. Uh, it's hard to write. Uh, Helm charts that have dynamic webhook configs for that reason. Um, the next one is uh, KMS v2. So this is um, the uh, extension point that is used for uh, uh, encryption at rest. Um, the current KMS uh, extension point has been alpha for a very long time. Um, it had we, over the years of working with it, uh, a couple of issues have come up. Um, uh, the, um, it is hard for an administrator to understand what the storage version of a um, you know, secret that might be encrypted is, like what key um, it was encrypted at. Uh, the health check right now uh, that Kubelet or uh, QAPI server does on the KMS plugin is to do it encrypt, decrypt. It's not actually um, you know, uh, potentially very thorough. And um, there is a fundamental scalability limit with the current model because, um, you know, uh, right now, if like when KubeAPI server starts uh, and it loads its secret cache, there could be you know ten thousand secrets. Um, it will serially decrypt each one of those, and uh, each one of those has to make a round trip to the um, KMS provider, which could be you know a remote service um, that's expensive. Uh, so. Uh, this enhancement uh, plans to solve all of these problems, um, and we will be introducing a um, v2 alpha 1 version of that uh, KMS plugin API um, that should uh, address most of these major issues. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, 
uh, uh, token requests and bounce service account tokens uh, are now GA. So I think as of 123, rather than getting a, a secret backed token in your pod, um, you will get a um, bound service account token that is rotated by the kubelet. It's time bound. Uh, it's audience bound. Um, so uh, while that is awesome, those secrets are still, um, those old service account token secrets are still created, um, which uh, is not a great thing. Um, but we can't just turn off the token controller because um, you know we expect that some users are still using uh, taking those tokens and maybe putting them in Jenkins or like a GitHub action to authenticate to the Cube, uh, Cube API server. Um, so we are planning on trying to stop auto creation and uh, remove unused tokens, uh, basically by trying to detect whether those tokens are in use uh, somewhere else. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Margo. Uh, hey everyone. Uh, so today I'm going to be walking you through um, a sample implementation of a client Go credential plugin. Um, so what is a client Go credential plugin? So um, it's a way for uh, client go to uh, call out to an external um, uh, command to uh, get user credentials um, out of band. So the plugin can implement some kind of protocol specific logic, like for example, an LDAP login or an OAuth login, um, and then pass back opaque credentials uh, for, for client go to use, and by extension, um, you know, kubectl uh, to use. Um, typically. Um, usually then um, on the server side that requires um, like a webhook authenticator uh, to interpret the credential um, to take that opaque token and make it into something meaningful for the Kubernetes API server. Um, so like when a user executes a kubectl command, they're uh, invoking the kubectl binary, um, which is then in turn um, executing um, uh, client go. Uh, Client Go uh, takes that kubectl command uh, and makes a request to the Kubernetes API server uh, based on that command. Uh, when you add a credential plugin into the mix, um, before you make that request to the Kubernetes API server, Client Go invokes the credential plugin, um, which then um, does some out of band authentication uh, and uh, returns a credential to client Go. And so this is kind of um, a nice way to um, extend Kubernetes because Kubernetes can't necessarily natively support every auth protocol out there. There's just a lot of different ways that people do things, SAML, LDAP, and so people can um, bring their own out of band authentication and uh, still be able to use that with Kubernetes. Um, and so then once that, uh, uh, credential plugin returns the credential to client go. Um, it, it gives us this opaque token. Um, client go makes the request to Kubernetes API server, um, and now it has a bearer token uh, attached to that request. Um, and then uh, after that happens, the Kubernetes API server is typically set up with um, a webhook authenticator or maybe an OIDC authenticator. Um, the token itself is opaque to uh, Kubernetes. So uh, then Kubernetes makes this uh, token review uh, that the webhook authenticator is then uh, waiting to see. And it, it sees that this token review has uh, this bearer token. Uh, and it's able to interpret the token uh, so that the Kubernetes API server can use it uh, for you know, things like access control, you know, take this user info that is now interpreted to tell us the username and, and use that uh, for whatever it needs. Um, typically, the way this is set up is uh, your user has a kubeconfig, um, and that kubeconfig has uh, the exact uh, field and within that it's it's calling some command so this is you know some a path to some binary that exists on the machine uh, it's got an API version uh, 
it's got some arguments that are uh, called with the, the command that you're calling. Um, and then uh, it's got some information about uh, whether uh, the, this needs to be interactive. So whether uh, when kubectl is invoked, it needs to be in an environment with a TTY. Uh, and it's also got an install hint. So uh, when you call this, this binary, like if it's not found in the user's path, uh, it's just a little helper to tell them maybe where to go uh, to install it. Uh, so I'm going to walk through the symbol plugin now. Um, this is uh, based on uh, my experience with um, Pindiped, the project that I work on, um, but it's pretty simplified. Um, so this one is written in Go, but you don't necessarily have to write the plugin in Go because um, the inputs and outputs are all um, through uh, standard out. So you know if you wanted to write a credential plugin in any other programming language, that's also totally possible. Uh, this one is going to be done using the OIDC password grant. So uh, it's going to take the user's uh, username and password from the CLI, uh, and then it's going to uh, take some information about the uh, OIDC configuration. Uh, it's going to get an ID token, and then it's going to package it in an exact credential, which is the format that ClientGo expects to see uh, this credential so that it can send it to the Kubernetes API server. Uh, so the entry point for this is just going to be a pretty simple um, Cobra command. Uh, so this is just uh, a pretty common way for um, Go command line utilities to be created. Uh, it's going to have two flags. Uh, both of them are going to be required in this case. Uh, and when you run this command, it's going to run this command called run OIDC login, um, taking those, those flags and passing them in as parameters to the function. Uh, another thing that's typically uh, part of that uh, initialization is uh, the Kubernetes exec info. So uh, when client go uh, invokes a plugin, it passes some data uh, via the Kubernetes exec info environment variable. So uh, this data comes directly from the kubeconfig, um, and it, it contains stuff like information about the target cluster. Um, so this could be useful, uh, for example, uh, if you have a cluster or you know, some authenticator on your cluster that's looking for a specific audience, and that information is based on which cluster it's running on, then in order to allow your uh, credential plugin to uh, craft the token correctly, it needs to know some information about the cluster. Um, so another important thing uh, to think about when you're creating one of these uh, credential plugins is, is caching. So uh, we, we need to cache credentials so you don't have to uh, fetch the same token every single time you make like a kubectl request. Um, these uh, credential plugins are invoked you know, every time that you run the command. Um, they're short-lived, so uh, maintaining that state somehow so you don't have to repeat yourself is pretty important. Uh, this is going to be uh, uh, stored on the local file system. Uh, so just like within the user's home directory, they're going to have uh, some config YAML file, uh, and it's going to be keyed off of uh, the arguments uh, sent to the command. So, uh, you know, in this case, it's going to be uh, the issuer and the client ID. So if you uh, issue the same command with the exact same arguments, you should get the same token back uh, from your file system. Uh, so this is what we're going to do to get the file from the cache. So we're going to create this, this cache key based on the issuer, the client ID, and the scopes. So some of this is pretty OIDC specific, but uh, you know, in any case, you want to have uh, some way to, to keep track of, of how it was called. Um, it's going to get the token, and this uh, cache.get token uh, is, is just a, a helper that uh, gets it from the local file system. You know, parses that YAML, uh, and then it's gonna. You know, if there is a value in that, in your uh, cache, then 
uh, you know, it's going to get it. It's going to check whether it's expired. You know, if you have a cache, but it's been like several days or something since you've used it, then you want to make sure that you're not just like passing back this this out of date cache token just because you have a value in the cache. So, you know, you're you're doing that check, and then if that's the case, then we're good. Um, we don't need to, you know redo, you know, a network request to your OIDC identity provider or, you know, in the case of a different identity provider than that out of band authentication either. Uh, and then uh, at the end, if you did have to get a new token, uh, then we'll come back to that. But at the end, uh, you can put the token back at the cache key so that the next time the process is invoked, um, you can get it back out and you don't have to do it all over again. Uh, another important uh, thing that you may need to do as part of a uh, credential plugin is reading uh, information from standard in. So, you know, maybe username and password. So uh, if you do want to uh, read from standard in, uh, you can uh, set the interactive mode in your kube config. Uh, so that can be to uh, if available or always. Um, in the case of always, uh, if you do not have a TTY available uh, and the user like, is not going to be able to type something into standard in, um, then uh, the, the kubectl command will immediately fail and it won't even try to invoke the plugin. Uh, if you don't want to do interactive mode, there's other ways. You, know, you can get some information from a file or from environment variables. So those are other ways that uh, you can have one of these plugins that don't involve uh, interaction. So I'm going to actually try to do this in my IDE. So uh, bear with me while I try to switch into Goland. Okay, sort of. We had technical difficulties with this before the talk, Sorry. so. <laughs> yeah, we tried to yeah. figure it all out, but. Uh. Alone. Yeah. Uh, all right, I feel less bad now. Ah, <laughs> uh. oh, there we go, okay. <laughs> Bigger font. All right, cool, yeah, perfect. Zoom in. Uh, yeah. yeah. Did that? Even that bigger. bigger. Command plus, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I don't know why command plus isn't operating like I expected to. Um, so is this, I could try to, if this is super unreadable, uh, try to do it via. We should have caught this before. Yeah. I, Command shift S. No. Close. Um, <laughs> uh, do you want to just uh, talk through it in verbosely? Yeah, sure. I yeah. can just yeah try to try to keep cool. it. Cool. So um, this get username and password function is in this case it's for OIDC password grant. So it's going to take these values and then it's going to pass them to an OIDC identity provider that's going to give us a token back with some information about the user. Uh, this function actually works both in interactive and non-interactive environments. So it's, you know, there's a way to get it from an environment variable. You know, for example, if you have some like uh, machine identity and you're trying to uh, run something in uh, your CI system and you, you want your service account to authenticate, uh, you can just pass these environment variables through. But if you have like a human user who's just trying to log in, uh, then we're going to prompt them for a value. So that here is, you know, it's getting 
you know, calling os.getter and under the hood. Uh, and then it's running uh, this prompt for value. Uh, bear with me because this is a little bit indirect for uh, testing reasons. Um, so we can do dependency injection. But the actual implementation here uh, is this prompt for value function is first checking whether we have a terminal. Uh, it's printing out uh, a prompt saying, like, enter your username here, basically. Uh, and uh, then it's creating a channel uh, with the, the result of the user typing in their username. Uh, you know, and then in this separate process, it's, it's waiting here for the user to type their username and then press enter, and then it's passing it back to that channel. Um, and at the end of that, you know, it's just going to trim spaces and uh, yeah. return the value uh, once it gets that result. Uh, there is a little bit of a different way that you have to handle passwords from usernames. Um, you can imagine people, when they're typing their username, they want to see it as they're typing it. But that's not what you want for passwords. You uh, you want that to be hidden as you're typing it. You don't want to just see your password in plain text as you're writing it. Uh, and there's actually um, a built-in Go standard library function uh, called read password that uh, hides local echo so that you don't have that uh, displayed as you're typing it. Um, and other than that, it's, it's kind of similar. Time, so. time check. Now I'm going to attempt going back to Firefox. <laughs> uh, all right, so Command oh. Shift F. Um. <laughs> And then, yeah, hit slideshow. Beautiful. All right. Um, yeah. Oh, and then, the, yeah, the last step here sorry. is, yeah, we're going to package the token into an exec credential, which is the format uh, expected by client Go. It's going to, this is using uh, client Go's libraries because it's in Golang, which is pretty handy. We take that token that we get back, uh, which I'm you know, kind of going to hand wave over because that's pretty specific to OIDC. And you'd, you'd do that differently if you were using a different type of uh, auth. Uh, Sorry. But yeah, so you take that, and then you uh, serialize it and send it to standard out, and client go can then do all that stuff to send it to the API server. Awesome. Thank you, Margo. Um, so yeah, I, I wanted to do one more highlight. So uh, well, uh, what Margo just talked about is a GA feature of Kubernetes. We actually have some future plans for it. Um, uh, this is the last highlight. So client exec proxy auth um, is currently a proposal uh, that is under review. It allows for uh, richer support for authentication protocols, such as like request signing protocols, um, for example, AWS v4 or, um, you know, Kerberos. Uh, and I, I kind of think of it as like the counterpart of authenticating proxies, which is a model for uh, extending Kubernetes authentication that um, you know, some users use. Um, and that uh, concludes our content. So uh, these sl slides will be posted on the website if you guys want to click through to on any of the links that you saw. But so we have, we have a Slack channel. If you want to get a hold of us, uh, Sigoth, um, we meet every um, two weeks, uh, Wednesday, 11 Pacific time. Um, we have a mailing list that you can join and a really long agenda doc. Feel free to drop an agenda item on at any time to join our meeting. Uh, we love having new people and um, a lot of exciting stuff going on. So um, with that, I think we have five minutes for questions. Um,
Hi, can you hear me now? Yep. All right, so one question about the um, credentials authentication. Um, so I've been using it for a while now, but um, there, I've been experiencing issues when it comes to uh, the authentication failing. So in my case, I'm using another CLI in the background to grab the token, and uh, Azure CLI in this case. And uh, when the Azure CLI needs to be authenticated, you need to do that out of band. And uh, this means that uh, if I do f fail the, uh, this uh, binary, uh, the client executable will try to run it multiple times. So it will try to like run five, six times in a row, and there's no way to tell it that you shouldn't retry, you should just stop and wait. Do you understand the question? Yeah. Um I, I, I think I recall this GitHub issue. So that the idea was initially to on 401 to re-exec the plugin, um, and that had it, keeping track of um, you know multiple clients within a process has been a problem. But um, yeah, basically uh, we try to fix those as we find them, like people creating two clients with two authenticators, but uh, sometimes those re-creep in and we don't have like, we haven't figured out a holistic solution for it yet. So just file GitHub issues and yeah. All right, thank you. Um, any other questions? Couple. Hi, uh, thanks for the good talk. Um, I have a question about the trust anchor sets and like kind of kind of like a high level question. So. I understand that this is also going to be used to distribute like CAs for um, TLS between workloads. Um, so I'm kind of interested why, why does it make sense to include this in tree? And like in general, um, how do you maybe um, decide like which part, because like before like upstream, there wasn't really functionality that much in upstream um, for workload TLS. So I'm interested whether you already mm. have like a model, which bits for which bits it makes sense to include in tree and what should be out of tree and why? Perhaps. Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So um, I, I think like if we were trying to accomplish this for just, uh, for example, like cert manager, um, maybe a CSI driver makes sense uh, because then, you know, somebody can accomplish that out of tree. I think uh, my main motivation for uh, implementing stuff within the Kubernetes code base is um, one to make use of it in core Kubernetes. So we have um, uh, cert bundles that we are distributing to every single namespace. Um, and that does present a scalability issue with Kubernetes itself. Um, so uh, that motivates me to have it entry also for, um, you know, an entry API to reference it. Um, it really uh, needs to be at least the API defined uh, within the Kubernetes core code base. So, um, yeah, like, so I, I guess at a high level, um, you know, if we want to use it from like uh, core API groups or uh, for a core functionality of Kubernetes, um, we usually try to implement it in tree. Um, and then otherwise, definitely prototype outside until, um, you know, we find some rationale to bring it in. Maybe the other motivation might be if like everybody in the world is using a specific out of tree thing, then it probably makes sense to bring it in tree. Yeah. Hey, thank you for the nice presentation and the demo. Uh, I'm very excited about that because I'm working on something similar at the moment for, for 2FA especially, because that's something also a little bit finicky topic on the command line usually. Um, do you have a repo or some docs available somewhere with this kind of uh, sample code that you just showed? Like also the whole workflow with like both on the client side and then also the server side, maybe what needs to be done there and what needs to be set up. Uh, so, so a lot of the the, the client side code is uh, taken from the project that I work on, which is uh, Pitiped. Although uh, I should warn you, there's a lot of other like complicated stuff that's hidden away there. Uh, I don't know if you have a. I'm better, better answer for some of the, the you know, the sample of a, a webhook authenticator and that side of things. So that link on the bottom is the KEP. It's actually fairly thorough documentation on 
uh, the design of these plugins and how like we expect them to work. I think we should probably also add to this slide a link to your uh, the code that you walk through, which is on GitHub. Um, and then we will post these slides uh, on the schedule um, after this. So, yeah. One other. Okay, uh, we're out of time. So if you have other questions, just come grab me. I'll be right outside. Um, awesome. Thank you so much, everyone.